Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the International Space University Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program Astronaut Panel. Uh, I am Omar Hatamli, the program director this year. I would like to welcome all of you, and thanks for taking the time to be with us here. Uh, before we start the program, just uh, would like to remind you, please, to put your phones on silent, and uh, in case of an emergency, there's two exits, one on top and one on the left here. So uh, today we have a, a very exciting program, actually. So we have uh, Professor Walter Peters and astronaut uh, Paolo Nespoli, and each one of them uh, will give us a different perspective about uh, the astronaut life. One of them will be about selection, the training process, and one of them will be about the life as an astronaut and, and complexities and challenges that people will face um, on orbit and space. Uh, after that, we'll have questions and answers, and um, also will be questions through Twitter um, and social media, and we'll try, obviously, to go uh, with as many as possible. We'll try our best to do that. At the end of the program, also, we'll, um, we'll have be a, a picture opportunity and signature uh, of pictures, and um, uh, we'd like to give the priority for, for young kids, the future generations, to be the priority in, in, in asking questions and taking the pictures and signatures as well. Uh, but before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge uh, the Gunnar people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. Uh, we pay respect to the elders, past and present, and we extend that respect to other Aboriginal people uh, present here today. So to start this event, I would like by introducing uh, Professor Walter Peters. Um, Professor Walter Peters actually has a distinguished career in the aerospace field. And um, he started with ESA in 1983, um, and uh, he, he stepped up with multiple uh, appointments. And one, uh, one of the recent ones before he left was um, head of the Astronaut Coordination Office in Cologne, uh, Germany. And he was responsible in that role uh, for selection um, and the training. And so he's very intimately familiar with, the, with what entails to be in that life. Um, and after that, he went to the International Space University after his retirement from ESA. And um, he had uh, different, uh, different um, uh, positions, uh, ranging from being the dean of the university and then becoming the, the, the president of the university. And recently, actually, he just uh, left that job, but he's still actually the president emeritus of that job of the university. And then recently, actually, he's been having so much, he got so many awards, and recently he was awarded the Legion of Honor, which is one of the highest um, uh, honored um, awards in, in France. So we're very happy to have a very distinguished set of panelists uh, with us today. Please welcome Professor Walter Peters. Thank you very much, Omar. Um, and indeed, as you said, I see there is a lot of uh, young people, and I'm not only talking about the participants, <laughs> uh, but also a lot of children here. That uh, is a pleasure. Let me let me do a first check with all the children here. Who of you would like to become an astronaut? Hey, no, no, there must be more. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> uh, are sure? Yeah, only. I think maybe more, maybe more. <laughs> so so that, that is a very uh, interesting question to a certain extent because there is something that we have to explain to people every time. Roughly spoken, medically, 83% of you can go into space. Maybe only for a short space flight, but that's medically the, the threshold, that 83% of you can go to space. So you... The first question is, well, if 83% of us can go to space, of the so many billion people, why were there only 540 astronauts? That's roughly the, the figure that we have now. 530 is 540. The reason for that is that the screen doesn't work, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> the reason is that we have two principles. One is called select in, and one is called select out. What does that mean? A commercial company like, uh, uh, yeah, who, who is doing space tourism, suborbital space tourism, would like to have as much customers as they can. So they will only take out those which are problematic, like people with uh, cardiovascular problems where they think there may be a problem. So they will take a maximum of people to do short flights. Now. The opportunities that we have at the moment are very limited, so we want to take in people 
that have a minimum risk to have a problem in space, which is completely different. There can always be a problem. You can always have an astronaut who has a little accident. But at least we try to minimize the risk by selecting these people, which are medically so fit that the probability that they have an accident is the lowest. Just to put it in terms, don't know if you know these figures, the, the chance that you get ill is something like six or seven percent of you will get ill next year. Hmm? <laughs> but not you. <laughs> uh, but an illness, even if it comes on board for a small illness, uh, that's okay. But what is worse is that one or two percent of the people on Earth have an illness which needs very professional treatment. And that would be a problem. If you would have a number of astronauts on board, and one of them has a serious problem that you have to come and return to Earth, that's what you want to avoid. Because if you make the calculations, with a crew of six people, as we have now on the International Space Station, that, we, that means that statistically, every five and a half years, we would have to come down for an emergency. And that we don't want to do. So that's why we are very, very severe in our selection. Now, how do you become an astronaut? That's probably what a number of you are very interested in. Well, from time to time, we need new astronauts. So we make an announcement of opportunity, and we tell, us, we tell you what we want you to be as an astronaut, which education that you want. We want you to have, for the youngsters, we want you to have very good notes at school. Otherwise, you don't become an astronaut. That's already the first message. We want you to be in a good condition, do sports, live healthy, stay away from certain things like uh, where the students are uh, enjoying sometimes too much. So <laughs> be careful. Uh, and then we're going to select on paper, because what else can we do? As I, uh, uh, the first time I was involved, that was before uh, my friend Paolo was there, we had 43,000 candidates for 12 people. And what can you do then? You can only select very harsh on paper. That means, again, we only took these people who had very good notes on their uh, transcripts. Because how else do you select? So at the, at the end, you invite a number of people and you uh, let them undergo a number of tests. Basic tests, astronaut-oriented tests, like neurovestibular, and then medical tests, if they are in a very good shape. Then only you're going to take a number of people. Roughly, you can contest these numbers, but an experienced number from the uh, Space Association of uh, Space Medicine says that if you want to, want to end up with one good astronaut, you better start with 1,000 candidates. So I'm very sorry to, to give this negative name message for those who want to become, but okay, uh, you, can, you can still, because in every step, only a number pass. After the basic qualification, your 100 is 30% of it. After the astronaut test, another 30%, another 40%. And then finally, you end up, and here it becomes a bit gray. I had a long discussion with, uh, with my friend Paolo on that. Here you come up with a number of people who went through all the tests and frankly spoken, who could all be an astronaut. How you go from 28 to one, there are a number of elements uh, maybe you want a certain nationality if it's ESA, maybe you want a certain gender. So there are a number of elements which influence that. But I would say each of these people, Paolo, I think you agree with me, could be equivalently a good astronaut. So what are these requirements? Well, I can only talk about the ESA requirements because that's the one I know pretty well. Uh, we prefer to have people with a bit of experience, a bit of live experience already, 27, 37 years old in that, in that time frame, in that age frame. The length is nothing to do, or the height has nothing to do, by the way, there's also an, uh, a bit of a misunderstanding, but has to do with the anthropometric dimensions of the capsule and of the suit. So the, an EVA suit, you can only make longer or smaller up to certain limits. So um, this is nothing to do with any discrimination, that we don't like long people. <laughs> that is nothing to do with it. Uh, but it is just pragmatic. And also, uh, if you've been sitting in the Soyuz capsule, you will know that uh, people of our length, me and Paolo, we were at the limit. <laughs> uh, certainly if your, are, uh, if your legs are a bit long. Uh, 
So we want to have people at a very good health, uh, medically, having a university degree, university degree, either a university degree or a pilot degree, a little bit less now pilot degrees because that was more in the time of the shuttle. A lot of uh, uh, psychological requirements, and, but I want to underline one psychological requirement, and that is manual dexterity. Because an astronaut on board has to do everything. He has to do plumbing, he has to do electricity, he has to do repair work, he has to do everything. So you want people who can work very well with their hands, so, and you will see that is one of the tests that we are often doing. Just for your uh, information, if you see there, on the medical test, I think there are two main elements where people fail. It's not, it is not dramatic. It is not that it's something that you have for the rest of your life, but mainly the, mainly the eyes, cardiovascular, are the tests where, which uh, we are very, very critical about. So uh, is there nothing in your, uh, in your EKG, in your electrocardiogram, and so on? So professional requirements, again, Pro operational skills. Last time, uh, Paolo, you were not there, but last time somebody asked an astronaut, what would you, rec what a young person like you, said, what would you recommend me to do? And, well, and I got a very interesting uh, answer from Bob Tursk. He says, do some adventure, to, like mountain climbing, or, or diving, or uh, so, something which, where you go to the extremes of your uh, thing. That, that, that is always a, a very, strong asset for the recruitment people. So then we have this little group of astronauts selected, and as I said, that doesn't mean that the other ones would not be, are not good, it has nothing to do with it. What do we normally do as a program? Uh, first, there is a sort of basic training, because a, bit like, a little bit like in ISU, we have astronauts which have different backgrounds. You can have a medical doctor, somebody with a degree in physics, an engineer, a pilot. And the first thing we try to do is bring them to an equal level from knowledge. So it is a bit like a, an extension of the ISU uh, uh, lectures. When they go through this uh, first phase, there is a mixture between collateral duties, as we call it. That means they will be assigned to a certain laboratory, assigned to a certain task, and advanced training until the moment that a number of them are picked out to a certain mission. So to a specific mission. So a number of them are then taken out and they will be trained for this mission. And then they undergo this mission training in NASA. In ZPK is, the, uh, is better known, I think, for most of you by uh, the name of Star City. Yes? So in, uh, near Moscow, 35 kilometers uh, outside of Moscow, roughly. ESA in, our, in the European Astronaut Center. And JAXA, that is in Japan. That's the Japanese space agency. Roughly two years before, before they will be trained for that mission, and then they fly four to eight months at the moment, more than six months most of the time, with some flight activities. So again, I have to, to, to specify that when you look for good astronauts, you need all-rounders, because you need people who can do everything on board. You cannot call the plumber in. You cannot call the electrician in. Even you cannot ask the fire brigade to come in. They have to do it all themselves. So they have to have the skills. Few pictures or few uh, impressions. The first time that uh, the, the astronauts, most of the time what they're doing is in ZPK, is learn Russian, which they all don't like that much. but. Uh, as I said to the students uh, yesterday, it's very important that everybody speaks the same language on board in case of an, uh, an incident, that you don't talk with three languages, because that would be catastrophic. So they, you see them very often like this, walking around in ZPK, going from one classroom to the other, running from one to the other, plus a number of uh, preparations for their flight, uh, in the beginning, in normal suits like uh, Paolo is wearing now in the storage capsule, and afterwards they have these uh, these bigger suits which uh, can be pressurized. We call it IVA, so for intervehicular activity. So it's a suit that can be pressurized for a few hours in case you have to return, and just in case there's a pressure loss in the capsule. 
There's also more spectacular things like uh, training for an EVA and that you do, as you see there above, that you do in an, uh, a facility which is called a neutral buoyancy facility. A neutral buoyancy facility is that you're like a sort of swimming pool, but that's not, not a nice word. And the astronauts are put in a very big suit, like if they go outside, and you regulate with the weight that they stay roughly at the same height, so that they float. So it is a bit the same thing as simulating microgravity. You also have to prepare them for uh, things like survival, because it can as well be that the Soyuz capsule lands in an area where, they, where you are not so fast with the rescue teams. So they will have to know how, with whatever they have on board, the parachute and so, to make a number of tools to a few hours or a few days take care of themselves. Once they know the mission, it, then you go and do mission training. What does that mean? You know exactly in that case which experiments you're going to have to do. So you, they will be trained on doing these experiments, not only the nominal, but also the off-nominal. That, that means what happens if it doesn't work? How can I repair it? So again, this dexterity. So they will do a lot of work on looking at experiments, working on experiments. They probably know also which plant, of course, there, there are more unplanned and planned repairs they will have to do, and they will know which exactly which EVA that they have to do. Again, planned. Yeah, as you saw the last time, maybe for those who follow, there can be also EVAs which are unplanned. That means if there is something outside, you have to go outside and you have to improvise. But what, whatever we can prepare is being prepared in advance. And then, interesting enough, in the Russian system, for those who fly with the Soyuz, which is now virtually all the astronauts, there is a sort of very systematic and very traditional flow. Something like uh, after the final exam, by the way, the, in the Russian system, most of the time, a little bit less power atomic, but most of the time you have two crews which are equivalently trained. Uh, they go to the, uh, to the wall, to the, on, the, on the red square, put flowers uh, on, uh, where Gagarin uh, has been uh, buried. Uh, also signed this very interesting, I found, from a cultural point of view, they signed this book in the office of Gagarin, and if you have a look in the office of Gagarin, everything is still there, like when he left. So also the clock is standing there at the hour that he died, so it's very, very traditional. Two weeks before, they leave to Baikonur with two different planes, because you have two, they, they split up the two crews in two different planes, just in case off there would be an accident. Uh, so the normal, and the, and then in Baikonur, this was too fast, in Baikonur they go in a, in a sort of quarantine. Now why is that in a sort of quarantine? That is not because we want to avoid that the astronauts runs away the last days and says, I don't want to fly. No, no. Uh, what we want to avoid is that the astronaut gets some germs or gets some beginning of a disease and then takes it on board. And, if, and of course, will infect the other one. So it, it is really prophylactic to avoid infections. A few other things which are taking place uh, in uh, Baikonur which are a bit unusual. Something like five days before the, the flight, they plant a tree. And uh, also something which is uh, spectacular very interesting. The evening before the flight, the astronauts are invited <laughs> to look at a movie, and that was the movie that Yuri Gagarin loved so much, The White Sun of the Desert. Now, the, um, the story which I, I, I always tell about it is that, of course, the other people, not the astronauts, some of the astronauts, yes, but the other people in the room have seen that movie so many times, so many times, I'm talking about 40 or 50 times, so that if in the movie somebody opens the mouth, the whole room knows already what he's going to say. <laughs> so it's, it's, so you, you have always everything in two, in two steps. The day, in the morning before they leave, there is the blessing ritual, which, by the way, was not there in the beginning, has been introduced only later, which is also very dangerous, uh, because if you're getting a little bit too close to the priest, you are wet. The, the, and really wet, I can tell you. 
they, they come with a bucket of water and they feel obliged to, to empty that bucket. And so they... <laughs> So then they go to the, uh, to the uh, launch site. Also a few interesting traditional things, which uh, maybe most of the people don't know, but uh, the Russians are respecting perfectly this rhythm, like in the time of Yuri Gagarin. So exactly, you can put your watch on it, at seven o'clock, the Soyuz rocket leaves with the train. And what you normally then do as a guest is that you have to put coins on the rails, so these coins become very big. <laughs> when, the, when the Soyuz rocket went over it, your little coin becomes such a coin. And the astronauts are not allowed to do that. That, doesn't, that uh, brings uh, bad luck, according to that. Also on bad luck, uh, it is excluded to have a launch on the 24th of October, because there once was an accident on the 24th of October. So you see a little bit of uh, a standard rhythm, but also a little bit of, uh, yeah, don't uh, well. It's it's a bit to do with the with the Russian uh, Russian soul, I would say. <coughs> now, just one uh, topic which uh, students know is very close to my heart personally. Uh, in the Outer Space Treaty, they have found a very nice name for astronauts, and they call them envoys of mankind. I find that a very very nice name, and it. And that is uh, also very, very true if you've been a bit involved in it. If you take, for instance, the first time that the Russians and the Americans flew together in 1975. 1975 was the middle of the, of the Cold War. So you see the picture here of the astronauts before. Two different groups, clear two different groups. They even had two different colors. So they were very separated. One group standing close to their uh, uh, Russian flag, the other one close to the American flag. Look a few years afterwards, these people who were then very distant from each other became probably the best friends in the world. Certainly these two, Alexei Leonov, who I met not so long ago, and uh, Tom Stafford, these people are really buddies. Now you have to, to, to know that these people were both generals and were both fighter pilots. So originally, they were in fact trained to be enemies. So you see that space can, have, can be very, very beneficial, not only via the astronauts, but also the thousands of people working for it, for mankind to come closer and closer together. Of the 540, as I told you before, astronauts, we have a very famous one here today. This one, Paolo Nespoli. <laughs> uh, and let me a little bit relate to what I said about the requirements uh, and how that relates to uh, Paolo. Well, Paolo was uh, first was military and has done a number of uh, uh, adventurous things like jump master, parachute instructor in the special forces. And afterwards went to study at the Polytechnic University in New York. Uh, he got his degree in uh, master degree in aerospace engineering, then worked as an engineer, and then came as a, uh, we were colleagues there we were at the European Astronaut Center as a training engineer. So he was in 1998 he was selected to be member of the ESA astronaut corps. So an ESA astronaut with an Italian accent. <laughs> all, uh, all our astronauts are ESA. Uh, he was on, he got some training, as we said, in the collateral duties, and finally got uh, three times in space for a total of 330 days. Uh, first time in uh, 2007 with the space shuttle, that was, uh, were shorter flights, but also very interesting flights, 15 days. It was a relatively long flight, by the way. Uh, most flights were 12, 13 days, so you must have been very, very economic with the resources on board. Uh, to make 15 days. 2010, for the first time, he went to the International Space Station for uh, 159 days, and then 2017, and that's why last year, when we had the event here, he could not be here. Uh, he, was, uh, he was somewhere up there for 139 days. So 313 days in space in total. And uh, Paolo is going to give us certainly very interesting stories about it. Paolo, can I invite you?
Yes, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Walter, for the uh, introduction here. Thank you, Omar, for having me here in uh, Australia again. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. I just came from Russia a few days ago, went to Houston, and then here. It's, uh, I don't know, many degrees difference between Russia and here, but <laughs> see. Um, so I have uh, about 10 or 12, 15 minutes maximum uh, to do my 257 slides. Uh, we want to leave you to leave some time so you can ask questions. So I'm going to go very fast. This is uh, me uh, when I wanted to be an astronaut. Of course, it was impossible. I was a kid, but it's a long story. Uh, eventually, I ended up, as Walter said, in the Army. I never wanted to be in the Army, but for some reason, I was actually, I was drafted. Uh, there was a draft uh, in Italy at that time, so I ended up going in the Army. And strangely enough, I decided to stay. I was there for seven years. Ended up uh, becoming an officer, paratrooper, special forces, doing all sorts of crazy things. And then, I, and then at 26, 27, I decided, well, I need to go back and do what I wanted to do, which was being an astronaut. It was a little bit late, but uh, uh, I, I managed to get a degree in uh, aerospace engineering in the United States. So I could study English because I did study French in school, so I did not speak English at that time. Uh, and eventually, it took quite a long time, but in 1998, when the European uh, Space Agency decided to create a unified astronaut corps, because uh, until then there were astronauts from Italy, from France, from Germany, but, and few European astronauts, but they were all competing to get the few slots in space. Then, 1998, they were all put together, and I was fortunate enough to be selected as uh, one of them. Uh, at that time, we were 15, four French, five Germans, three Italians, one Spanish, one Swedish, and one Swiss. Usually, when you say like this, it's the beginning of a joke or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but as you can see, there were five pilots, nine physicists, a lot of physicists, one engineer and one medical doctor, 13 males, one female. That's the statistics there. Uh, so I, I, I started. Uh, training as an astronaut, my training alone lasted less than one day because they told me, okay, uh, go to uh, NASA. And they actually sent me, they sent four of us, or those four, for the, they sent us to NASA. Uh, we were assigned to the 17th NASA astronaut class, the Penguins. The Penguins, because uh, this was the name given to us uh, by the class before us, uh, because uh, we came after two big recruitments, and at that time, in essentially three years, NASA doubled the number of astronauts without having the flight opportunities. So they told us, uh, okay, you're like a penguin, a bird that never fly, uh, <laughs> never will fly. And in fact, it took quite a long time. It took almost 10 years before I would be assigned to a space flight. Uh, but I was eventually assigned to STS-120, the 120th flight of the space shuttle. It was a, a, a space flight, very complicated. When they announced that flight, they told us is the most complicated mission that, my, uh, that was designed for the shuttle. A 12-day mission on the book. Uh, we were supposed to bring in space a module for the space station and then move a, a solar array. And in fact, we have a pretty serious emergency during the flight, and we ended up 15 days because they had to extend the mission three days for us to try to make up and solve uh, the problem, which we did. So it was a very interesting uh, situation. Came back from the mission, and uh, I was assigned to another one. Uh, I was supposed to fly again on the shuttle, but all sorts of reason. There were no more slots. Uh, there was all sorts of crazy things going on. And eventually, they told me, well, OK, you know, you're all qualified for the shuttle, but now go to Russia, study Russian, uh, learn again the vehicle. It's going to take only three years, and then you can fly in space again. Well, thank you. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I took off uh, this time in uh, 2010 for a, a four and a half month uh, mission. Uh, and, uh, and then I was fortunate again to be assigned to another long duration mission, this time in uh, 17. 2017 until the, uh, the end of 2017, so came back more or less a year ago, more or less. Uh, it was uh, very interesting, and I think I'm very fortunate to have been able to, uh, first of all, achieve my childhood dream, 
And then being able to fly, and then being able to fly both uh, on the space shuttle and uh, on with the Russians, uh, experiment the, the, the speed of a space shuttle mission and the quietness of a long duration mission. It's two completely different uh, missions. In fact, um, I want to take a few minutes now to talk a little bit of what we do on the space station when we are there. You know, as I said, on the space shuttle, the mission is very, very complex, but the, the, it's short enough that they can plan minute by minute. And in fact, when you lift off for the space shuttle, it doesn't really matter when. Uh, you set your watch to zero, and the time in space starts when you lift off, and you follow the, the planning as it was. It, you know, it could delay a few minutes, you could delay a day, you could delay a week, you still uh, lift off at uh, mission elapsed time, MET zero, and then you follow with that. That doesn't work like that on the space station. On the space station, you actually find G follow GMT, and you follow the planning of the space station. Uh, roughly, the day, I know every day is slightly different, but, but more or less every day starts around 7.30 in the morning, and you are on duty, means you are, you are supposed to work until about 7.30 in the evening. Um, and then, you have, and then the, the time is actually not scheduled. You are supposed to take about an hour and a half for uh, you know, eating, cleaning up, do whatever you want, sleep theoretically from 10 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the morning, wake up at 6, an hour and a half to prepare for work, and then, and then start work again. That's, uh, that's how, how is the day. But in fact, nobody tells you what to do from 7.30 until the morning. You can do whatever you want. You want to go to the window and stay six hours at the window, go ahead and go at the window. Or you want to sleep 10 hours, you want to watch a movie, you want to stay on the phone, uh, do internet, email. It, it doesn't matter. As long as you show up in the morning at 7.30 and you're ready to work. Uh, on this 12 hours of work, we have, uh, in fact, eight and a half hours or or uh, activities which is mostly uh, scientific uh, or technological or educational activities, and then two and a half hours of physical fitness and one hour uh, lunch break if you manage to take it, because usually something happens and lunch break is gone. This is one of the timeline. I just took it, I just took it, what it was, it 2018, it was uh, 3rd of May last year. So it shows you uh, this is the, the current, this is it's in fact what we have on board. It's not so simple to try to have six people on board in a very small environment to carry out all sorts of complicated thing, things without impacting one with each other, making sure that all the resources needed are available. You need the hardware, you need the electricity, you need gases, you need supplies, you need uh, videos, whatever. So the planning team is uh, really making sure that, that each one of us can work up there without, uh, without any problem. Um, there are some convention here when, uh, when an activity is, is blue bordered, like this one, or this one, this one, it means it needs to be done exactly at that time. You know, you, you have to, you start exactly that minute. Because, if, if, because some resources are available only in that period. If you miss it, you cannot do it later. Uh, so you need to be really careful about this one. Then there are the, the, the kind of a pink activities or the violet activities. Door, those can be moved around easily. You just have to maybe even talk between yourself on the station and it's fine. While the black activities can also be moved around, but you need to talk to the control center. You need to have the agreement of whoever is responsible for this. It could be, I mean, Russia, it could be Munich, it could be Tsukuba in Japan, whatever. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty good. And you see this red line is the, is the time of the day. We call this the uh, line of death meaning that you need to follow this line. And if you deviate from this line, you need to, to do something. So you, you better, you know, if you are a good astronaut, if you actually you go through the whole day doing what this line tells you to do, and you don't need to call uh, the control center to change things or, or ask for information or stuff like that. Uh, this was the planning for Expedition 26, 27 concerning the experiments that were assigned to me. I, I just sh show you this one just to tell you that we are really busy in doing stuff in there. You, you can end up uh, doing activities on, I don't know, human research, res uh, research uh, then all sorts of different uh, 
um, uh, topics in, inside that, and then fluid physics, material science, combustion science, radiation, biology, education, technology demonstration, facility operations. Uh, we get uh, trained, uh, all of us on station are trained to uh, be able to uh, intervene on several experiments. Uh, and also uh, maintenance activity. There have to be at least two or three people that can do the same maintenance activity because otherwise uh, if somebody gets sick or cannot do it, somebody else has to do it. Uh, we did, um, I have to say that uh, after, after Expedition 26-27, which was in 2010, where almost every day we had to call Houston and ask for some changes because there were some problems, I was impressed for, for last year because uh, when we were there, everything worked almost as planned. So they learned a lot during these years, and it's, it's interesting. You know, it was in 2010 that they told you it take, you know, 20 minutes to do something, and it would take 45 or an hour and a half, or the opposite. It said, it takes an hour and five minutes, you're done. Oh, no, not five minutes, but 20 minutes, you're done. So instead, this time, it was really precise. I mean, it would be a few minutes, more or less, but, but if they tell you it takes an hour and a half, it probably takes an hour and a half. And, and also, the facility never broke. You know, I still remember the toilet broke about 27 times in the five and a half months that we had uh, last time. And this time, in five months in space, it broke zero, not once, which was incredible. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. So we, we started no knowing how to make this thing work, and this is experience. So these are some of the pictures that uh, we took in space. Uh, we have a glove box, which, by the way, was built by the European Space Agency. It was one of the contributions of uh, ESA to the space station. It's an American facility, but it's given by, the, by ESA. Uh, we do critical experiment inside there, so if something breaks, you know, uh, it, can, it can stay contained in there. Uh, there is another one uh, where we do some other experiments. There is a microscope and can be operated by the ground. I, I was handling here some uh, uh, cancer cells, some culture of cancer cells in space. Uh, this, is a, this is Bob Tursk, by the way, and I, I is you uh, aficionados, right? Um, uh, managing uh, another uh, contribution of the European Space Agency. Is, is, this is the Melfi. It's a, it's a freezer that goes down to minus 90 degrees, so you better have gloves when you open the freezer, unless your, your hands are going to stick in there when you put your fingers in there. Uh, we can do all sorts of experiments, and the astronaut in space have usually two roles. You can be the executor of the experiment, which is the hands of the, the scientist. You know, we are not scientists ourselves. We just execute what they tell you to do. So Katie here is the, is the hand of the experiments. I am the guinea pig here. <laughs> Happily, uh, she's checking if I have any brain left. Uh, <laughs> not that much, actually. Um, this is Katie in the Japanese uh, laboratory. There is a Japanese laboratory. There is a European laboratory there. There is an American laboratory. There is a Russian laboratory in there. This is, this is uh, here. It's a long, there will, you know, I could talk about the slides for half an hour. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do it, but it shows you a little bit the space. If you let things go, they disappear. She's all suited up with all sorts of kind of monitoring uh, stuff. Uh, you know, we end up uh, doing all sorts of medical experiments and you are. Uh, basically the, the main guinea pig. Uh, we in space, we can do a lot of things that you cannot do here on ground. That's the reason why you do things in space. Uh, this is a, a complex equipment. It's an American equipment, and it's able to actually burn flames in space, which is not that easy because of the convention problem. Uh, and actually, uh, with this uh, equipment, they discovered last year uh, now two years ago, a year and a half ago, they discovered a new class of uh, flames that burn a lower temperature than we, we did know here on Earth. And this is very important because if we can uh, get or so ameliorate the, the uh, capability of burning of fluids inside uh, engines, for example, uh, even for a low percentage, that would mean a lot for all the um, uh, engines that are in the world. Uh, this is an experiment of the Italian Space Agency trying to detect uh, 
things on the saliva. This is a, some sample of my saliva. Or, uh, today you can do these things, but you have to go to a major hospital. Uh, and, uh, in Italy, only two hospitals can do this. Uh, and and I was able to do it myself in space. So it's a way to um, distribute the diagnosis of certain things and allow doctors to intervene without moving patients back and forth. Uh, educational experiments, uh, fluid physics, uh, uh, this is another one that uh, where a good guinea pig, they are checking uh, how your muscles, your bones uh, are changing while you are in uh, space. Uh, we do technological things. We launched uh, 27 microsatellite CubeSats from uh, space. Uh, we did some other testing. We were, I was testing this kind of equipment as a kind of a armor made of water, uh, which is uh, uh, blocking or trying to see how uh, effective it is in blocking space radiation. If we want to go to Mars, probably we need something like that. Um, this is Katie playing with a furnace, playing, working on a furnace, uh, not to cook, to, to cook uh, uh, cookies, but to melt uh, metals, so we can do this in space. Uh, here I am in the Japanese laboratory, it looks very complicated uh, or very confused. Uh, in fact, there's a picture taken like this. This is a levitator, so the Japanese have made little um, spheres of materials that we don't even know is ceramic uh, something. They send that in space, we can put it in there, and then they can actually check without gravity the properties of this material. Very, very interesting, very commercial, by the way, it's a commercial activity. Um, we can do educational things, talking to school, uh, using the ham radio that we have on board. Uh, we did like 70 connect, uh, uh, calls with schools. We have to do exercise, which is kind of interesting, two hours, two, hour, two and a half hours per day. We have a cycle ergometer in there, which is kind of weird because it's kind of different than, than the normal. Uh, we do have a treadmill. Uh, you better be linked up, otherwise you're going to hit your head uh, very quickly. And uh, we have even a weight machine, which is kind of strange because, you know, you're, there is no gravity and you're doing uh, weights, uh, li lifting weights in space. So. But it's interesting, absolutely necessary because uh, the spine elongates in space and then you don't fit anymore on the, on the Soyuz coming back, which was my case, by the way. I really had serious troubles fitting in the Soyuz again uh, because of the spine elongating. And then also your legs, uh, they are not used anymore, so you get these chicken legs, uh, they are called uh, like this. We do all sorts of activities that have to do with uh, spreading the fact of going to space. You know, This picture was taken while I was talking to the president of Italy, uh, which generated a lot of news uh, in Italy. And also, we've had the opportunity to, to talk to the Pope. So, uh, we managed to talk to Pope Francis, which was very interesting because, you know, you always get the, the, the questions about, you know, how the toilet works and things like this. And he started talking about, you know, God and other things. So, we were all like, oh, my. <laughs> they, they not quite know what to do. And by the way, it turns out that he doesn't speak English. He speaks Italian or Spanish. So, he simply told me, okay, you can translate Russian, English, Spanish, everything. And I was in space translating for the Pope. So, very... <laughs> Very stressful and interesting. But uh, it's official. So the Pope uh, talked to extraterrestrial people. It was us, uh, you know. Um, so this is to tell you that in any, in any given day in space, you might end up uh, doing all sorts of crazy things. You wake up in the morning, you start with an experiment, then you do another, then you fix the toilet, then you talk to the Pope, then you go back to, <laughs> to, to handling uh, mice or mouse, and you keep going like this, and then eventually it's evening. OK, very good. That's what happens uh, in space. It's a very, you know, six months or four and a half months. And today, they try to go as long as possible, which is 200 days in space. And then the Soyuz needs to re-enter. Uh, you don't decide how long you stay in space. It's all a question of orbital mechanics, of how the vehicle, uh, the schedule, and everything. It, our last year was relatively short, 139 days. But it's still four and a half months. It's a long time to be in space though the, the time it passes uh, very fast because you're really, really, really busy. Good. So we should, uh, we should have some questions here. Yes. Okay, so we'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, there will be some of our staff with microphones on both sides of the room here. So please uh, raise your arm and uh, say your name and, and the question, please. Uh, Tom, there's that. And maybe the young... 
Uh, guys, also, if they have any questions here. Hello. Uh, s Sam, Sam here. Listen, uh, I, I noticed you only had one meal break in, uh, do you only have one meal break in 24 hours? And uh, also, do you expect to go up again so you can clock up 52 weeks in space? I, I'm sorry, I did not quite understand the question. Yeah. I, who, who can? I need a translator yeah. for a. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, and so when you put the list up there, you had a lunch break, one hour. And you, well, lunch you, break. Hmm? One lunch break in 52 days, what was it? No, no, in 24 <laughs> hours. Yes. Do you have breakfast and lunch yes. and then dinner? And yes, all yes. That? Oh, now, I, now I get it. Yes, uh, food is very important in space. In fact, uh, they, they spend a lot of time in trying to figure out how to, to give you food. Uh, they don't really care about you eating. They want you as a machine <laughs> working, which means you need the uh, uh, protein, vitamins, the calories, all of this, and they study this. And of course, bringing food in space, it's, uh, it's very expensive. So they try to make it in a way that uh, it's uh, uh, more convenient for all the system. We do have, uh, as I showed you before, we, have, we do breakfast before you start working in your time. So 7.30 in the morning when you start working, you are, you are supposed to already to have had breakfast. And then you have this lunch, lunch break at you know, midday, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, whatever. You have one hour there. And then dinner comes after 7.30 in the evening. You, you are free to do it whenever you want. So there are three meals that are scheduled. Then if you want to eat five times, it's fine. If you want to eat two times, it's fine. But usually we have three, three meals scheduled. Uh, we do log all the food that we eat. And all the log goes down to ground, and there is a nutritionist that is looking at what you're eating, it, it, and, and you get a report every week. Oh, you eat too much fat, you eat too much sugar, too much, uh, too little uh, calcium. You know, you get this kind of report and, and tells you, oh, too, too little calories. You tend in space, uh, by the way, to eat little. Somehow, people eat less in space than, than they are, and then you start deficit in calories. They discovered this uh, after the first few years, Everybody who went to space came back like 10 or 15, some people even 20 kilos uh, lost a lot of weight. And that's a problem because you lose muscles, not fat. <laughs> so, so, so they are now very, very, very attentive to this. Okay. I think we have a question from a few. Uh, no, I don't think so at the moment. We have a question from a future astronaut here on the, on the side. Um, my name's Thomas, and I was just thinking, um, what, are there any side effects after going into space for an extended period of time? If there are any side effects uh, if you go in space for an extended period of time, yes. There are some, uh, so we are not built to stay in a microgravity environment for a long time. And in fact, we are actually built, our structure, it's made so that we can uh, uh, take care of gravity pushing on us. You know, the, the skeleton and the muscles are made so that we can walk. We have a vestibular system, which with the equilibrium tell us where, the, where is a, uh, high, when it's low, and things, things like this. You can close your eyes and still walk on the ground, but then you are in space and, and all things become complicated. There is no more up or down. Uh, the, the body feels that there is no more gravity and correctly so decides that we don't need the skeleton anymore and starts, and starts dissolving the skeleton, and which is pretty bad. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, well, actually, you know, it, it, we, we lose, uh, now this is complicated, but for the people who understand this, we lose uh, calcium up to 10%, uh, uh, 10 times faster than an osteoporotic person here on the ground. Uh, which means that we are a good guinea pigs because, you know, they can measure what happened to you. They give you some medication or something, and they, and they clearly see the effect of that medication. So there are changes. I lost uh, about 4% of my skeletal mass in space. I got a good uh, uh, percentage of radiation. In space, you get a lot of radiation, and, you know, I'm radioactive, more or less. No, no, really, but I got more radiation. In fact, uh, uh, the, there is one... Uh, one thing that the astronaut have uh, uh, as a more percentage of cancer than other people because of the radiation that you get. Uh, the, a lot of people have problems with the eyes, 
There were five astronauts that had uh, serious problems with their eyes, lost uh, part of the vision because of the pressure inside. I mean, we don't know exactly. We think it's because of the pressure inside the skull. Uh, it pushes on the eye, on the optical nerve, damages things. So there are a lot of things that are happening. At the end, uh, life is a, it's a, it's a trade-off between risk and what you get and what you do. And uh, yes, I know I get a little bit of more damage than if I would be on the ground, but I think it's all worth. Sure. Hi, Piros Radamissis. Thanks for that, that was really good. Where, where are we? Oh, here. over here. Uh, two part question, what was the most enjoyable part of your last deployment on the space station and what was the most challenging? Well, uh, you know, I was surprised that I got assigned to a third space flight and this was, uh, and the fact that then I started the training and I flew, that was, uh, that was really enjoyable. I mean, at the end, uh, flying space again. I would say that uh, there are two things in space that are unique that you cannot have here on the ground. And one is the feeling that you have when there is no more gravity. And I, it's an incredible feeling. It, it's completely different uh, uh, way of behaving. Uh, it, it's very, at the beginning, it takes quite some time to get used to it uh, because we are used to have gravity. And then you go to space, you don't feel really well. Everybody says, oh, the first time you were at the window looking out. Yeah, I wanted to puke, you know. <laughs> I, want, I mean, it was like, I don't like this thing. I, your body's all loaded. So you, it, it takes some time, you get adjusted to it. You know, I would say a couple of days, it's okay. You are kind of like, but if you really, really want to feel normal and start really appreciating things, it takes like four or five weeks before you, you start moving around and you don't, you know, bang, in, bang into things or, or you're thinking how to eat or you drink something and you choke, something like that, or you sleep and you cannot sleep because you're floating, you know, things like that. Um, the other one is the capability of looking at the earth from up there. So when I flew up and uh, for the third time and the, one of the most enjoyable things was <coughs> to relive again this, uh, this thing. Uh, challenging, uh, I was the, for me, the, 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 actually it sounds strange, but uh, I've, I've done a lot of things in my, in my career as an, astro an astronaut. I never quite was able to do an EVA, which is a spacewalk. And I really wanted to do it, and I got very, 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 very close this time. But for one reason or the other, somebody says a good reason, I'd say not so good reason. Uh, but for reasons, uh, I never did it. And that was difficult for me to accept that, uh, you know, I... Uh, I, I needed to accept this and keep going with the mission because there was still a few months to go and, and it was interesting and challenging for me. Maybe I can ask a question to, to Walter. Um, in the next decade, uh, the demographic and the landscape of the future astronauts will be a little bit different than what we have today, which are basically sent by space agencies. So from your perspective and working for such a long time in selecting and training, what would you say the, the changes and variations will be in these aspects to, to align with the future? Well, one of the, one of the things that we, we learn is that our restrictions in the beginning were too severe. I'll give you one example. When we were selecting astronauts, we said, and that's also interesting for the children, you have to have perfect eyesight, 10 out of 10. Now we relaxed it a little bit and said, okay, 10 out of 10, but you can have it with corrections. So for instance, with, with, uh, with uh, glasses or with, with lenses. So I am pretty sure that the medical criteria will, will relax because we have learned that uh, uh, they are not so severe as we thought. Uh, but the, the key is going to, to stay a little bit different. The, the key will, will be, do we have more flight opportunities? If we have more flight opportunities, uh, we will relax much more. If we don't have flight opportunities, we, we, we will continue, as I said in the beginning, to select out. Because we don't, we, we... The 28 people that I showed, for instance, if we have flight opportunities, we take them all. Yeah. So give, us, give flight opportunities to, to us, uh, increase the budget of the Australian Space Agency, and uh, we'll fly more people. Yeah, nice. Thank you, Walter. But I, I would say that uh, one thing that we need to do absolutely today, you know, to, to be part of uh, a professional astronaut, they ask for a technical degree, 
but I think this is, I would not say it's a mistake, but yeah. let's say it's a requirement today, but we are still missing out on all sorts of other disciplines, you know. Where are philosophers, yeah. writers, you know, musicians, uh, right. f movie director, photographers? We take so many pictures and we think, <laughs> and we think uh, they are so good, but I'm thinking, you know, if there would be here a photographer, I'm thinking uh, something, something else will come up. So we need to, to put a, a slice of the humankind in, in space uh, and not absolutely. just a little, little thing. Absolutely. And this will happen. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, there's the people behind. Okay, please. I've got one at the back here, so thanks both for... Where uh, are we here? Oh, <laughs> up there. Yeah. Thanks both. It's a very interesting talk. I just wanted to know um, if you held any... Sp specific or particular records for being in space or anything that you've done uh, in space, whether that's a record at all? World record or that type of thing? Record? <laughs> oh, well, I have uh, the distinguished uh, record uh, of being the oldest astronaut that flew in space. <laughs> <laughs> Actually... Actually, actually, John Glenn flew on the space shuttle when he was 77. But, uh, but it, that was a short duration flight. And on, with seven crew members, you can have one crew member that is sitting there on a the corner, and it's fine. <laughs> I, I don't want to take away anything from John Glenn, but, but you know. Um, uh, I, it's not, it doesn't work like that when you have three crew members and uh, you, know, you need to work. So uh, today I'm the, the oldest uh, astronaut in the world that flew on a long duration mission. That's one uh, record. That second record, I am the tallest one that flew on the Soyuz. Uh, actually, probably, well, I'm, I, I don't think I'm the tallest one on the shuttle, but close to be the tallest, uh, but on the Soyuz for sure. And theoretically, if you actually take the, the uh, brute height, I am outside of the maximum height uh, uh, that, that can be inside the Soyuz. But I have the fortune, because the, the Russians are a little bit more flexible than the American, is that it's not only height, total height, but, but you need to check the length of the femur, kind of strange, the length of uh, the, what they call the sitting height. So there are different compositions. And strangely enough, I have a longer torso than legs. Uh, and, and because of this, they can fit me inside the Soyuz, which is a pretty strange uh, combination. But anyhow, I have uh, the record of being the tallest one uh, flew on the Soyuz. This story of the record, though, it's kind of like, is this the question you were asking or something? Because this is, this is all, all I guess from the, from, the, um, from the journalist usually. What is your record of something? And I'm, I think we are running out, out of records. And, uh, <laughs> and I kind of joke and tell them, well, next time, I go in space, I will pee on a corner of the space station, and I will say, I am the one who pee on the south, north corner of the space station. Because, I mean, come on, what does it mean, record? I mean, it doesn't mean nothing. Everything is going to change. People will go to the moon, go to Mars, and all of this is just noise, by the way. Okay, we have a young person here. Uh, uh, do you find it comforting or concerning that the Soyuz is so old? I'm sorry, say, if I have concern that the Soyuz is so old? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that the Soyuz is so old? <laughs> Actually, it was funny, because I, I still remember one, uh, one of the first time I was in Baikonur, and I was walking toward the launch pad and they were carrying this train with the rocket and I'm looking, I was looking at it and I'm like, and I had a Russian engineer following me so we were walking and I'm like, that's, but that looks like the R7 and the, he was surprised, he says, R7, you know the R7? I said, well, I'm an aerospace engineer, you know, isn't the R7 the launcher that they used to launch Yuri Gagarin in space? <laughs> he said, yeah, it works and we still use it 50 years later. <laughs> and then he said, and you will fly taking off from the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin used 50 years ago. We painted a little bit, you know, but, <laughs> but it's the same. Um, so the question is, it's actually this is an interesting question because I flew on the shuttle first, which I would say is like the Ferrari of, uh, of, uh, of spacecraft. You know, it's like uh, the shuttle even today was designed in the 70s, built in the 70s, flew on 1980 the first time. Even today, it's, it's retired because it's too advanced. 
It's not this too old because it's too advanced and they had to retire. Even the American cannot handle it, it's too complicated. Now you fly on the shuttle and then you go on the Soyuz and you're like, oh my God, what is this thing? They, somebody built it in his garage uh, yesterday, <laughs> taking some kind of metals with the hammer or something, painting it with the thing. And, and you, you have this approach at the beginning. It's an old spacecraft, and kind of like this. And then you start learning to it, and it's actually very, very interesting spacecraft because it's been decided with the mentality of fail safe, meaning that there is not much you can do to do something wrong with that spacecraft. With the shuttle, a lot of things wrong. <laughs> you know, it takes years and years of training uh, for, for, uh, for flying on the shuttle. I mean, I, when I was a crew member of the shuttle, I had to do at least one simulation every week. Because if you don't do, you forget things, and you're not able to fly anymore. On the, on the, on the, spa, on the, on the Soyuz, is fine. There is a, you know, there are a lot of things on the shuttle that can break, and in the Soyuz, they cannot break, because simply they are not there. You know, <laughs> which, is, which is the best way not to have something that breaks, you don't put it in there. And you find a different way to do the same things. Very ingenious, incredible. You know, when I was training on the, on the Soyuz and they were telling me, okay, this is how we do this, I would tell them, are you kidding me or something? It will never work. And then they put me on the simulator and sure enough, it would work, no problem. And, and so this is one, uh, one of the lessons learned for what concerns me. We are used to throw technology at problems. You have a problem and you solve it with technology. And then the technology breaks, you put more technology, and you put more technology. You put, look at our cell phones today. They have what, a gyroscope, a, a, a three or four accelerometers. They have all sorts of crazy things in there, which we use maybe sometimes, sometimes not, but they break. And then you throw away the phone and you buy a new one. Perfect for the people that make the phone. Um, but so the, the, the point is that uh, we, sometimes we exaggerate it on, on technology, on things. Uh, while we should try to do simple things. And this is one of the things that I always tell to engineers like myself. We like to design complex things. Try to make it simple. You know, it's, it's better and uh, it works better for everybody. So, bottom line, yes, the search is kind of old. It's kind of a dated design, uh, but it does what it's supposed to do. Bring in three astronauts from the ground to the space station, stay there for six months or eight months, and then come back safely with the minimum uh, training possible, with the minimum risk possible. It does that with no problem. If I would have in my garage, in my house, a Ferrari and a, an old Fiat 500, you know, one of the old, old, old one, and I just need to go to the store, you know, a way to put the grocery, I would probably take the Fiat, not the Ferrari, because, you know, I might break it or get stolen or get scratched or something. I'll just take the, 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 the Fiat and it works and no problem. Okay, on this side here. Uh, my question's for Walter. You mentioned that astronauts were superstitious. I was just wondering if there was any other traditions or rituals that didn't make it to the presentation slide that you might want to share about tonight? I, no, no I, uh, I wouldn't say that the astronauts are superstitious. I, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, what I meant is the... Uh, uh, what we live there, Paolo and uh, myself as well, is that the, the Russians are superstitious. So they, uh, they, they, they didn't want to deviate from their scheme because they were afraid that deviating from the scheme would bring some bad luck or something like that. But it is more in their nature. You will never see a Russian walking under a ladder. Never. So they, they, it, it is in their culture. No, astronauts are not superstitious. That, uh, that I wouldn't say. Uh, what you have is, of course, that some people feel more comfortable by doing something in a certain regular and uh, regular way. But that you have in, in, in other things also. That's what the first thing they will tell you if you play golf: do it always the same thing. The same thing. Prepare yourself the same way. And I think that gives some comfort, but it's not superstitious. Okay, on this side of the room, please. Hello, my name's Katrina. I had a question in regarding to the amount of exercise you do per day, that you spend 20% of your time exercising. Um, and I was wondering what the actual value of that was, considering you lose your, um, your bone density. The only impact exercise you're doing is running while being weighted down. What are the other benefits of spending so much of your awake hours exercising? Well, um, you know, there was... Uh 
I, I'm not quite sure I, I fully grasp the, the, the base of your question. You think it's too much or you think it's too little? Too much. Okay, yes, okay, then, then I, got, I got it right. Um, well, the problem that you have in space is that you are always constantly at rest. You don't use anything. So, are you at rest right now? No. No? Why not? <laughs> you're sitting down, you're not doing, you're not running. Well, you, you are not at rest because, for example, your head, it's kind of, you're, you're, you're using your muscles here to keep your head up. You're using your back muscles to keep you up. So you feel you are at rest, but you are not at rest. You constantly use your, your muscles. I walk and you constantly use my muscle. Now, you are in space. It's like you are laying on a bed here on the ground and don't do anything for six months. That's very dangerous. Try to, to stay one week laying on bed and then I say, stand up and go. See what happened. And this is what happens in space with all the problems that are happening there. And, and, and so they, they calculated, you know, they don't want you to spend, uh, uh, they, they want you to work up there. But they need to have you as a machine working in the best uh, form possible. And, and so this, this calculation of time of, one hour of cardiovascular exercise. No, I did not have time to go through, but one hour, why on the cycle ergometer or on the treadmill? Because you need to move blood around, uh, you have to exercise the lungs, the heart, uh, and everything. And then you do an hour of uh, uh, weight training because you need to load the spine, for example. You know, what happened, you are in space, there is no more load and the spine elongates. I was seven centimeters taller than, than here on the ground. Which, which causes a lot of problems, by the way. A lot of people, oh, yeah, I want to go in space. Yeah, right. And then, and then your muscle, your, your ligaments, everything. And some people have uh, excruciating back, back pain in space because of this. Uh, and then, you know, by the way, the spine eventually has to go down again. And this process can cause problems. A lot of astronauts had to have uh, surgery because of herniated discs or things like that. Um, so, we do exercise in order to maintain your, your physical fitness, your strength, your capabilities, so that your body loses as less mass as possible, and when you come back to, to, to Earth, you can actually recover pretty quickly, which takes, still, takes, uh, well, there is now a three weeks period that you do in Houston, or in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, under a medical control, where you do four hours of uh, recovery physical exercise per day for three weeks, uh, on top of doing all these science experiments and everything. And, uh, but still, you know, they do some subtle exercise and they show you that you think you can walk normally, but uh, you actually did not recover as well. And they do some kind of disturbances, you know, like they, they, they hit you or something and you whoop, you fall down because you're not able to, to control again your muscles or your vestibular system is not yet able to, to understand what's going on. And so, so you do exercise so that you can recover much uh, better when you come back on the ground. We have time from, for one more question only. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, it's John here. I assume that the station's orbit has to be boosted every so often because it would otherwise decay and break up. Does the, how, how is that done? Does the process impose any extra strain on the station? And what sort of G level do the astronauts experience during the boost? Wow, that was a very technical question. I don't know, did you guys get it? I, I barely got it. Uh, <laughs> So if, if we reboost the station, what kind of uh, stress is in, in, uh, imposes on the structure and on the astronaut, right? Essentially, that's what the thing. Uh, well, yeah, the, the station flies at uh, about 400 kilometers. There is a little bit of, uh, of material up there which, you know, touches the station, and the station drops about 100 meters a day, more or less. So if you don't do anything, eventually it's going to come down and, and uh, uh, hit the atmosphere and, and destroy it. Um, so it needs to be reboosted once in a while, and they do, they do this periodically. They do it in a very intelligent way, uh, which is uh, by using the supply vessels. So when you have supply vessels that get to the station, they have enough fuel 
to uh, try the docking twice. Because, you know, you have this 20 tons of material, something happened and suddenly you cannot attach to the station. What do you do? You throw away 20 tons and it costs a lot of money. So what happens, the, the docking stops, the uh, vessel go back away in a safe uh, uh, area. You don't want to hit the station or cause any problem. Stays there, they try to solve the problem and then it has enough fuel again to try to dock again. Normally, it's not needed. Normally, the first time it docks, and you still have uh, a lot of fuel in there which is not be used. What do you do? You throw it away, uh -huh. you use it to boost the station. So you, you actually use that fuel uh, to, to accelerate the station by the fact that you accelerate, the station goes up in orbit, and then you detach the vessel, throw it, throw it away, the station comes down, the next one comes. That's how it's done. It's very gentle. It's uh, the, the, the force that these engines can do is not that much. But, you know, in space it doesn't matter. Every little force, it has an effect and it will boost the station. I, I don't know how many boosts we did, two or three times or four. While I was up there, I never felt anything. You know, you don't feel anything. What, one thing that you may feel is that sometimes they turn the station because you want the, the push of the engine in the velocity vector, otherwise, you know, you go God knows where. So they, if the, if the, if the um, vessel is attached like this, then they have to turn the station so that the engine pushes in the right direction. So sometimes uh, they tell you, hey, there is a reboost maneuver, blah, blah, blah. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Then you go to the window, oh, what is the earth? You know, <laughs> what? Oh, oh. You know, because you're used to, you're, you are used to see it in a certain way, suddenly it's completely different. It's just because they're doing a reboost. That's the only, the only thing. Obviously, when they built uh, the structure, they have to take this into account. Because, uh, you know, it's a huge structure. It's 100 meters uh, long. Uh, even, you know, it sounds strange, but the, you, when you do exercise, uh, the equipment is totally isolated from the station. Because just by doing exercise, you can induce uh, the, the solar array. In, and and if, you, if you go on the wrong frequency, then you can rip off the solar array or do something. So everything is isolated. And even with the isolation, when we do some uh, very sensitive experiments, there are some uh, um, crystal uh, growth experiment or some, we, we, we do some, uh, they are called uh, liquid bridges. Uh, where they check certain, so some experiments are very sensitive to microgravity, they tell you no exercise. And, and even when you walk around the station, they or walk. When you move around the station, they tell you not to hit, uh, hit the wall or to, to do something strong because even that little thing, it, it, will, it will ripple through the station. So the station has been built to sustain this kind of vibration. Think uh, the fact that out in space, when you're flying around, you get uh, 40, 50 minutes of sun, and then uh, half an hour of, of dark. And just this, uh, this huge structure going from plus 200 degrees to minus 150 degrees, you know, it makes the, the metal kind of go nuts. And, and, and so the, the structure really takes care of uh, absorbing this uh, variation in temperature and all of this. So it's a pretty, pretty interesting uh, technological thing, the, the space station. It's very, very interesting. All right, uh, let's give our distinguished uh, panelists one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming here tonight. Yeah. We'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening here. And uh, Paolo will be available actually for signature signing pictures and for any questions he has, you have as well. And also would like to invite our uh, participants and VIP guests to join us for the reception at the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery. Good evening, everyone.